up everybody and welcome back to the podcast. On this episode of the podcast, we're going to look at how an experience that I had in the past actually helped me to understand pain a little better. And I want to talk about this because sometimes we, when we think of pain, we always think that there's a certain level of it that our body will react a certain way and we have to wait for it to pass. And what I want to talk about is sometimes how we experience pain or how we have experienced pain in the past will actually shape how we experience pain in the now as well. And it's really important to consider this, especially as you deal with injuries and you, as you deal with flare-ups going forward. And the more you know about it, the more capable you will be to, I guess, work on it yourself in a lot of ways. So I'm going to tell a story and the story itself might be a little bit gruesome for some people to to pick up the details but it's important to understand it to this degree so that you can see that okay well if if anyone can do it if one person can do it anyone can do it in a lot of ways and I'm going to talk about time that I spent boxing and one specific incident that I had uh, that really tested this theory of how pain can be controlled and I was always I guess aware of how pain will inhibit motivation if you let it and I spoke in a past episode of how we used to actually train to overcome pain in boxing and to improve your tolerance for pain by doing arm holds where you had to hold your arms up and do little circles where we did ab holds where you were in a position that you were holding your abs and then somebody was hitting it or they were dropping a medicine ball in it or they were they were doing something to try fatigue you and to try to kind of break your willpower and in a lot of cases it did break people in that they didn't, they couldn't keep going, they stepped back, some of them stopped boxing because of it, uh, which is not a obviously something to to brag about, but in, in a lot of ways it shows that if you are not in the right mindset when you encounter this type of an issue, oftentimes it can really take hold of you. So I want to use this to help you understand and to change your perspective on what pain can do and how you can... I guess, control your pain a little bit more. And in our club, when we were boxing, a lot of it was about respect. It was about learning respect. It was about if you were fought outside of the club, you were thrown out of the club. You weren't really allowed to come back and box because they didn't really have a tolerance for that. If you were caught fighting outside, you were out. And they were pretty strict at that as well. But what they were trying to do, it wasn't at the start as much about winning championships as it was about creating people who are respectful, who can grow up, who have the self-defense, who kind of get confidence in themselves. And it was my father and Patrick who had kind of kicked off the club again and got it going. And in a lot of the time, when you're talking to them, they'll often talk about different people who came in, came through the club and left it in different ways. Not with Irish championships, not with Munster championships or anything like that. More so that they came in and that they came out, when they left, they were better people where they might have had asthma in the past and they had dropped that or they might have been afraid of a lot of uh, situations and they had gotten over that or developed a confidence in these situations and through these experiences you will you have to kind of learn that and anyone who knows boxing it's a very violent sport uh, in a lot of ways in that you are going in it is a fight you're going against somebody else and the aim of it is to try to stop it as soon as possible really you can obviously at a certain stage it'll be left up to the judges but if possible you want to get in and get out as early as you can take as little damage as possible give out as much damage as you can so that the other person quits and gives up and that's something that people don't generally talk about when they look at boxing because they think about okay you go in and the judge they'll leave it up to the judges and that but really in any situation, if you're in a fight, it's a championship, you want you don't want to spend much time in there. You want to get in, get the job done, and get out. And thinking back on it, there's a lot of times that you go into these situations and there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety around it. But when you do come out the other side, uh, you have a different air of, of confidence to you. And when I think back on one situation, we when I went to college uh, up in Athlone, I got a scholarship for boxing, so I had to box in the different championships that were there. And there was one of them that I was involved in. It was the Irish Collegiate Final. And I had come up against a guy who I had fought in the under-18s, under-23s. I actually had fought him in his own club the same year. So this was the fourth time I was meeting him this year. And he was a top-class fighter, uh, amateur boxing in Ireland, 
always has been pretty good for us in that the Olympics, it, we, we generally take a couple of medals at the Olympics with it. And this guy, he was had just come back from the under-18 Worlds and he was fighting in the quarterfinal of the world the same year. So he was a top boxer. And I remember I was preparing for this fight. I knew what his style was like. I had boxed him so many times before. So I kind of had a little bit of a game plan of what I wanted to execute when I went into the fight. And the old Mike Tyson saying of everyone has a game plan until you get punched in the face is very apparent here in this situation. So in boxing, when you look at it, what you're trying to do always is you're trying to figure out patterns of what someone is doing and you're trying to counteract that pattern. So if somebody's throwing a certain type of jab or if they were throwing it from a certain position in the ring, you're often trying to figure that out and then you're trying to counter it in a way so that you don't get hit or take little damage and you can give off a lot of damage. You can, I guess, generate a lot of damage in the other person. And it was the first round and I had spotted this pattern. And I had big plans to capitalize on it in that when I was doing a double jab, which is when you throw a left and then you throw a left again for my one, he was coming straight back with this kind of left hook and a straight right arm, or straight right hand. So I was thinking in my head, okay, this is a pattern I can see that's consistent. If I can counteract this pattern, I could probably hit him with a with a harder shot. And if I knew that if I was able to do the double jab, if I took a half a step back and then I launched an overhand right, that I could connect. Now I am given the details here because it is important to understand that it, it is a very intricate sport. And I heard people t- talk about MMA and boxing and that they're they are sports with you have to be extremely reactive you have to make a plan and you have to execute a stra- strategy very fast because there's dire consequences if you don't execute that strategy because obviously you can get knocked out and in this case i was looking at it i could see as a there was a little pattern development great i'm going to try to counter this pattern and, and, and see what happens and i was really confident in this i guess this move I was going to do because I had it done so many times before in different fights and it was actually something that I had in a fight previous to that uh, I had connected and it started the, it ended up in the fight the referee having to stop the fight give him a count um, and then go back in and box again so I knew what I was trying to do I knew the goal uh, and it really was just about trying to figure it out and set that situation up so we were playing the game for the first 30 seconds and I was trying to line this shot up and trying to kind of set it up so that I could connect because if you connect well obviously things can can go really well for you because there's an element in boxing that you can break someone down as well Uh, you can break them mentally you can break their willpower uh, break them physically as well so that they don't want to continue and that's really the goal of when you're doing pain training at a young age that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to get that out of you as much as possible so that there's no point in a fight that you take a shot and that you have to stop or discontinue the fight. Obviously, every case is different and there'll be situations where you get caught and the situations where you you can't do that. But in the majority of cases, you're trying to minimize the risk of that happening. So the time comes, I stepped out. We had kind of, as I said, we were playing the game for maybe 30 seconds of the first round. We were going tit for tat. Then I stepped out into it and I moved around to the side. You're always trying to create these angles. I decided to throw my double jab, take a half a step back, and just launch the overhand right, putting everything behind it. So I threw the overhand right and really lent my head down into it. And then all of a sudden, I get this extremely, I don't know how else to describe it, but it's like a cold feeling. Like somebody had pressed a bag of frozen peas or ice and had just pressed it against your face. like. But the thing is, they didn't just touch it off your face. They pressed it, and then they kept the pressure on. They really held it there. And I could start to feel the cold moving from the points in the middle of my face in this kind of a wave across my cheekbones. So it was at the time, I didn't realize what, it had, what, what, it, what was after happening. But you get this kind of a cold, slow-moving pushing wave from the middle of your face all the way out to the side and it actually leaves a trail as it does that so you can feel every bit of it and in that situation right there my cheekbone started to 
started to get cold, it started to move out towards my eyes, my eyes started to water up. And at the same time, everything went black. So I was there, I, it's like everything moves in slow motion, you could say. My eyes went back black, but I was still conscious. And it felt like in how you would describe it as, if you ever think of how a movie or how if you've ever woken up on an operating table where you get the little lights that are above you, you can kind of see it and then it opens up and you can you get this bigger picture. I was stuck in this place that there was little stars that had filled up my vision. And you hear that thing about oh, the stars when, when somebody gets knocked unconscious. There was little stars in my vision had like in the top right hand corner I can still see it in the top left hand corner there's a little one there was one down the left side just let's say in line with my nose up with my eye and the cold feeling that had moved across my face had actually started to morph into this less diffuse point on both sides of my nose just underneath my cheekbones right on the skull so you can touch it yourself where your nose comes into your face just under your cheekbones there and there and the point was less kind of oh where's the pain and I could really feel it on on that specific area and it felt like it was weird like there was layers to the pain so there was one base layer of this cold kind of chilling pain that had covered my whole face nearly like a numbing pain then there was these two piercing spots as if somebody had taken a needle and twisted it into either side of your nose like it just poked a needle like an acupuncture needle or a dry needle or a dry needling needle but had actually kept on pushing it and twisting it and twisting it and twisting it into the bone where it had gone really deep and the last layer then was this kind of heating fuzzy cloud of pain that was over it all where the face my face had just gotten so red and what had happened was as I had leaned in to take the shot he had actually countered with this upper cut and it landed so clearly. This is why these guys are the top in the world. You see a pattern, you think you figure it out. They have figured out that you figured out the pattern and they capitalize. And in the sport like boxing, you feel the consequences very soon after that. So as I had dropped my head down, his punch was coming up and it was caused quite a bang that it hit me directly on the nose. Obviously broke my nose straight away but the referee hadn't seen it. So I had felt every single bit of it. The referee hadn't seen it and the fight had continued afterwards. So that's why when I talk about those different layers of pain, I was feeling each of those individually, but it had gone to slow motion. Okay, so it was like you could really feel your way through it. And honestly, it was was like being in a movie, moving through a movie in slow motion. I was conscious, but I could feel everything development, everything developing, I should say. But... I still had that black cloud over my face, so I couldn't really see too much, but I could think. And at a certain point, I remember thinking, this fight is still on. Like, we're still going here. Uh, like Even though I'm after feeling all that, and that's a horrible feeling, and my ears are ringing, I knew the fight was still on. So I knew if I didn't start to guard and get back into a good position, that more of that was to come. I, I honestly don't think that he realized what he was after connected with at the time because it was such a good shot. Now, to not get too gruesome about it, but slowly but surely I started to remember that I was in a fight and I kind of started swinging so that the referee wouldn't step in because if he steps in, that's a big problem for you lose the round, but then you lose the round by an extra point. So you're two steps behind as opposed to, or two points behind as opposed to one point. So you have to just straight away start swinging. And I did just start getting back into it as soon as I could and as the round started going on I could feel the blood coming out of my nose but it was really starting to fill the airway in my nose so this I could feel that pulsing pain where it's like a heat pulsing pain and everything starts to heat up on your face but any time that I was getting touched I could still feel the piercing in my nose and as I said, as the round went on, it blood started coming out, fills the airway. And if you've ever had the feeling, this is not to get too in detail, but I will. If you ever had the feeling of like a runny nose, but this time the liquid is so much thicker. And every time you try to inhale, the pain comes back. And the little airway that's left actually was getting blocked up. 
and I could feel it when I had inhaled stronger that it would start running down your neck. So it was like, you get that taste of iron. It's a real, oh, it's sick to think back on it. Real stodgy feeling like a soup. So I had to start breathing through my mouth. Sorry for the details, but it'll help you understand it a little bit more. And as the round went on, my consciousness started to stabilize. I was, I was conscious in that I knew I was there, but I wasn't exactly making a plan and executing a plan at that stage. But slowly but surely, as it started to come back, uh, I noticed, okay, well, I need to finish out this round. We'll go back to the corner and we'll deal with that. And I couldn't really see that much, but I remember going back to the corner and my father was there and Patrick there and they said, how are you feeling? How are you getting on? They didn't really see what had happened, but they could obviously see the after effects of it, where the two eyes were filled up. My nose had, was, was running as well. And I remember my father catching my nose and kind of pulling it to clean it out. Not a nice feeling. But I said, grand, everything's good. But I said, I cannot see a thing right now. So shake you up, get the ice pack, put it on the back of your neck or get the water, I mean, pour it on the back of your neck. Shake up a little bit to get you going. And we knew that the we weren't going to be stopping the fight. It was an Irish final. We weren't going to step out because of the bang. So it was go back in the second round, be a little bit smarter. Don't take too many shots and see if we can, if we can rebuild it. Uh, so we go back in and we start again. Now, this time, the coldness actually wasn't there as much. Instead, it was more of like a fiery feeling on my face. But every single time I took a shot, I could feel, I could actually feel the crunching and the grinding of the bone where it had been fractured moving over and back. So you could feel that grinding on itself. And it was a horrible feeling. But then you also, every time you get the grinding, you'd you'd get this really piercing, deep piercing feeling right into your skull. Like, honestly, like it's going into your brain in a lot of ways. It's like someone was sticking you with that needle. And the thing is, he actually didn't have to hit me cleanly. He just, even even if he hit the guard, I'd still feel it compress and I'd still feel my eyes start to water up. So when people ask you, what's your pain on the zero to 10? It was pretty high. It was pretty high. I would say an eight or a nine, let's say. It was pretty significant. But it, it was about midway through the second round and it was at a point of the fight that, okay, I needed to start pushing on here if I wanted to have any chance of winning this. I can't just be backing up all the time. The nose is broken and I had known it was broken, but it wasn't going to be fixed anytime soon and I was still going to have to finish out the rounds. And if I keep backing up, they're going to see that and then they're going to call the fight and they're going to, they're going to say, okay, the fight's off because um, they can see that somebody's hurt. So what I had to do is I had to start talking to myself. This was something that we learned with the Monster High performance in a lot of ways. It was like an iron bar doesn't bend. The idea that you, even though you're put under pressure, you don't have to break to that pressure. You just continue to move with it and you continue to keep the pressure or keep pushing back into it. And soon it will, it will stop. It's going to subside. And so I started to talk to myself in the middle of the round while I was trying to fight. And it was, that's feeling better. I actually don't really feel that anymore. Oh my God, the pain has disappeared. Jeez, he hit me there and that was actually really light. I'm starting to feel good again. I'm starting to feel stronger again. Okay, I'm getting my energy back. Jeez, I don't even realize, I don't even like recognize that pain anymore. And slowly but surely in the middle of it, I was able to start convincing myself that I had control over the pain and that the pain wasn't the limiting factor. What I did is I kind of changed my face, or changed my thought process, and it, the pain started to subside. My face was still hot, and I could still feel it, but it wasn't really sore. And an interesting thing as a side note, what you can do with pain, and you see this a lot with people who do great things after serious things happen to them, is that you're able to use it as an energy source in ways. So the fight went on for the three rounds. I ended up losing, but I came out with a really valuable lesson. And one of the lessons though is that people always say it's adrenaline that drives you on and that it turns off all the pain sensors. It, it's not, it, that's actually not anything what it, what it has to do with because you could easily give up and stop in those situations if you wanted to, if the pain got so bad. It's nearly like a refocusing of where your energy goes instead of focusing on the pain all the time and how bad it is and how severe it is and what it's doing and really, really 
focusing in on that. Instead, you focus on, okay, what can I do now? It's feeling better. You start looking forward and you start pressing on with it. And you'll notice that if you focus on it too much, it's going to continue to increase. And this is what I tell clients that I work with all the time is that if you're constantly talking about your pain to other people, if you're constantly talking about how severe it is, how much, how limiting it is, uh, if you're always thinking about it, you're always checking in on it, well, it's going to always be there. So you really need to start creating these scenarios in your head where you start saying, okay, this is getting better. It is improving. And you'll notice then that the body will start to respond accordingly. But it takes time, especially if in your environment, people are always talking to you about the pain because you've made it a topic of conversation. Unbeknownst to yourself, you've made it a topic of conversation all of the time. So the real lesson here was that you can manage pain. You can control pain in a lot of situations. And sometimes it's a good thing to do. Sometimes it's a bad thing to do. In this situation, it was something that I felt that I had to do. And you wouldn't even believe it. I went, it was, that was on like a Friday, Saturday. I had to get the surgery on the Monday to correct it. And stupidly, I get called up to these Irish uh, collegiate squad then to, to box against the army. And that was the next Monday. So I had a seven day recovery period. And then I had to go in and fight in the next one. And in the next one, it didn't really bother me. I was obviously a little bit smarter about how I blocked and how I guarded and stuff like that. But I was more excited to be there and excited to be in the fight. So I didn't really, it, it didn't affect me that much. But the whole thing is that conscious input is extremely important when you're dealing with pain. You may not know it, but how you think about it, the way you speak to yourself, the way you speak to others, the fact that you get up in the morning and you start checking on the pain, anticipating the pain, always looking for the pain, that will drive the pain higher. So we need to try to change that. And a simple way to change it is just to change the language. If you're aware of it and you understand that your reaction plays a role and that your mindset plays a role, that you can control it, all you have to do is make the decision at the start to be less aware. Or if you are going to be aware, be aware of how much better it's feeling. So I guess some of the lessons to be taken away are that pain can be controlled. Our mind is going to play a role in the amount that we feel. And the language that we use to describe it is so important. If you're always talking about it, unrelenting pain, nonstop, there 24 hours a day, I can't sleep, I can't go upstairs, I can't go for a run, I can't go for a gym. If you're saying, all, I go to the gym, if you're saying all of these things, it's gonna be difficult for you to make improvements on that long term because this is part of the narrative of how you talk about it. And this in itself will then drive the system to become more protective of it. So we need to be safe around that. We need to be smart. Once you've been and you've got it assessed, you've got it checked out and you start working on it, then you start talking to yourself and you start saying, okay, it is actually feeling better. I'm doing all the right things. Every day it's getting better. I'm noticing that I'm getting stronger. I'm getting more mobile. And it doesn't mean that you have to push through everything. No, it doesn't. But it does mean that your reaction to the pain will dictate the pain that you feel. So if you continue just to focus in on it, you will continue to have it. But if you can control your reaction and you can control the narrative and the language around the pain and you can feed back that to your body, even when it's tough, even when it's at its hardest, you will get back a lot of the control over the pain and you will reduce it and it will stop having such an impact on your life. So I wanted to talk about that story because that was a very acute reminder at the time that in those situations, even though it was broken and the nose was broken, even though it was continued to get hit, I could get, I could feel the grinding, I could feel it getting pushed over and back. I could literally feel the fracture of where it was. That's what it felt like. And I could feel it like there was someone stabbing me in the face with like a sharp needle every time. But with that, in this situation, take the time, use the language, understand that you have that mindset that can do it. In a way, it's like mind over matter. This works in certain situations, like you're not going to do this with every injury, but mind over matter, believe, put in place things that will help you and make sure that you are working on them to get it better. And you'd be surprised with how quick you'll start to recover from these pains and how quick the pain that's controlling your life will become less of an issue for you. 
But that's all for me today. And that's all I wanted to chat about. I hope that uh, first off, it wasn't too nasty because I know that there's a few details in there that aren't very nice. But I just wanted to get the point across that it's not a nice feeling and it's not a nice feeling as it continues. But once you can change your perspective and your focus, sometimes then it actually, not that it becomes a nicer feeling, but it doesn't become as a threatening a feeling and you're not as scared of it and the pain isn't as high because of it. If you have any questions, you can shoot them over to me. Um, I would love, guys, if you did enjoy this podcast. And first off, I want to say thank you to everyone who listens to the podcast because it without you, I wouldn't be able to keep making these podcasts. And it's one of the things I enjoy the most. So please, like, I do, I do really, really appreciate you listening to this podcast. Um, and I and I thank you. If you could, and if you do enjoy this podcast, I'd love if you could send it on to someone else that you think would find this interesting or pass it on to a friend. But I really want to try get the ratings on Spotify and iTunes up because it'll actually help me to get more guests on the podcast as well. I want to get it above a thousand ratings. We're a small bit off it right now, small bit. But in time, if we if if everyone can just go on. And if you can hit five stars, all you do is scroll up to the top of Spotify and hit that five star mark. Same thing on iTunes. It would be a massive help for me and it'd really, really help me to get on more people in future. And I would really appreciate it. If you've ever found this podcast beneficial, that would be a, a, a huge thing for me. And I appreciate it. Thank you for doing that. For those of you who've done it already. But that's all for me. I will chat to you all at the same time next week. If anyone has any questions, just shoot them over to me at Robbie Cassidy underscore on Instagram or info at the mobility tutor.com. And yeah, anyone who you know is going through an issue right now or is struggling with pain, send them on the podcast and uh, hopefully it can help in, in some way or another. Um, but that is all. Chat to you all again at the same time next week. Have a good one. <laughs>